Hello everyone and welcome to the Indian Online Summit. Our third session, um, it is Flowworks that we are presenting now, that we are talking with today. I'm very happy to welcome you. Um, my name is Tobias Schöner and I will hand over soon. This um, online summit is organized with our trusted partner, Raoul Commerce. With Extreme Distribution, we have Jutta Schöner here. She is the founder of Extreme Distribution and Oliver Moira, the CEO of um, Flowworks. So I'm very happy with the third session. Please register also for the one-on-ones after and always ask your questions in the webinar tool. Um, we'll try to address it as soon as we receive it. So thank you very much. Have a good time. about the products from Flowworks. If you have any questions, please type it into the chat and I get it over the earphones so I can address it and we can take it um, to, uh, to answer it to you. Yeah, Oliver, welcome. And uh, maybe you introduce us. yourself quickly and uh, give us an overview about uh, Flowworks as a company. My pleasure. Hi, everybody. My name is Oliver. I'm uh, with Flowworks. Flowworks is a company that makes software but we also actually host quite a few of our customer systems. What is it that we uh, really do? We produce solutions for media, and that is a very broad statement because we serve a very broad market. Uh, we serve production houses, post-production houses. We have industrial clients. We have big broadcasters as clients. We have rights sellers who entrust us with their content to monetize it. Um, in the end, what we really provide are two core benefits. One, we help people save time and money. Two, we help people make money with their media content. That's really what we do, but we encapsulate the whole thing in uh, software. Obviously, as I just said, we also operate that for some of the customers. Some of them have it on premise, others have it in the cloud or hosted with us or a mix of any of the above. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a general overview about the product itself? Yeah, basically the Flow Center, which is uh, the, sort of the main uh, descriptor, is a modular system which comprises of quite a few different parts. So we have certain customers, set, uh, let's say production houses, who are more focused on things like ingest, uh, editing, adding audio, adding uh, graphics of all sorts. So we have entire uh, processes guiding that. That would pretty much be called a PAM system, a production asset management system. We have other customers who are more focused on managing their archives. So they may have very large volumes of uh, items, not just in size, but also in absolute quantitative numbers, so going into the millions. That would be typical for industrial clients, for example, just to name a few. You will know SAP, you will know Porsche, you will know Siemens. BMW probably as well. Um, their focus is a little bit different. They don't produce themselves, they get content produced for them. Uh, so they need to take care of the ingest in a very automated way. And they are more concerned with editing and keeping on top of their archive and managing very large volumes for a very heterogenic uh, environment, user environment. That would be their own people who might be sitting globally distributed. That mm -hmm. could be partners, that could be journalists, so it goes into publishing, What is the main struggle people with such amazing amount of files are coming along? Yeah. Well, the struggle is, is pretty much always the same. People don't find anything. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they've got all this wonderful media content and it doesn't have good metadata or the metadata is in a separate system and you're stuck. I mean, try finding something on Google if you don't know what it's called, or you don't have Google, you're going to have a problem. And how does Flowworks solve that problem for well, the customers? The core, the core element of our system is still a MAM system. So it's basically a place where all of your media sits and all of your metadata sits, uh, plus all of the variants. For example, you will have different technical resolutions of the same file. You might have different language versions, different cutdowns, etc. So in the database, all of these different variants and all of the connected information is sitting in one central media container, also lovingly called the shoebox, mm -hmm. where if you know what your file is called, you will find not just that single file, you will find everything that's connected to it because in fact you're finding a database uh, media container. Mm. And how does it work when the customer can't offer a metadata base? 
Well, or a proper the, one. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's quite a common case. Uh, the usual case is that people will know what the file is maybe called, but the associated metadata might be somewhere else. So we're very good at uh, ingesting metadata, either reading it out from a file name, reading it out from an ingest root or routine, uh, creating even with MD5 checks, uh, uh, checks, you know, what uh, content you have and what metadata sits maybe on a different system and forming that right junction and then importing that metadata from third-party systems. We, of course, also use AI. We, you know, integrate stuff like Google, Microsoft, even IBM uh, to extract metadata automatically, be it from voice, be it from uh, original characters, i.e. text in the picture, be it uh, even the scene detection or a person recognition. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of ways of getting metadata. In fact, there's lots of metadata. The trick is really getting it all into the same shoebox because then it's going to be really useful. Mm. And there is also a way how you help the customer to get the metadata from yeah. the different departments or outside customers. Could you explain yeah. a little bit about that? Well, what we mostly have is a case that people know they have media and they know they have metadata, but they're not quite sure where that metadata actually sits. And they certainly don't know how to match it. So they might think that that video and that piece of metadata belongs together, but they're not entirely sure of that. So what we are very good at is not just doing the ingest of all of the various bits and pieces, but also mapping and matching the, uh, the, the uh, content together. And that actually also includes if you get ingested or uploaded by third party. Let's say we have, for example, a wonderful example in Wales, uh, the National Library of Wales, has a lot of co content coming in from the BBC, from ITV and other TV channels, uh, and they already have some of the metadata. So matching that and mapping that and doing that automatically is a hugely important task, because of course if you end up doing that manually or not doing it all, you're going to spend a lot of time and a lot of money. So automation is the key. Mm. Besides the metadata, what's important also to get a proper library of what you have? Well. It's really to think beyond what, you, what your immediate needs are. Because uh, we have a lot of customers who come to us and say, look, I've got a lot of media. I'm not finding my way around. Can you help me organize that? So we take care of that. That's really step number one. Uh, the second step to really take care of is where does additional new content come from? And how can we best ingest that into a system, be it live or be it from sort of tape, in a sense, coming from another archive? Uh, so the archive itself does grow and continues to grow and is able to grow, even including and incorporating additional new sources. That's step number two. And step number three is really making use and making best use of the media that you have because that's really where your value sits. Mm. In your balance sheets, that's going to be your asset. So it's very important. Um, what we uh, really help people with is to not just organize their media, but organize the access to the media. So what internal users do you have? What perhaps external production partners do you have? How do you integrate their, their, them and their workflows into the same system to avoid any copies, to avoid any duplication, to avoid any sort of unorthodox, I'm going to send you the stick and good mm. luck to you uh, type of ingest things, which will always uh, create a mess, which means you're going to spend time and money. So organizing the workflows of the people involved your own people, your external partners, but think of your customers as well. Those are the most important people, the people you actually show the media to or sell the media to. That's a hugely important step, and that's really step number four. That's when we start moving away from the I'm saving time and money into the I'm beginning to make money, uh, where monetization of the media content is, of course, of huge importance. And nowadays, we're not just talking TV, we're not just talking websites, we're not just talking VOD but add all of that social media, add all the new channels that are rising at a very high rate, which is great news for us, because we basically multi-channel publish to anywhere you would like to publish. And if you need some help to monetize your content, be it through ad-driven websites, we'll build those for you as well. If you want a VOD platform, it's good to go. Yeah, let's go a step back first mm -hmm. uh, to, to understand the modular um, functionality of the Flow Center itself. So there are different um, parts which defines the product and makes yeah. it special from different other 
mums vendors out there. So yeah. could you describe a little bit what makes you different? Where is the strength? Well, I, let's start with the strength. I think our clear strength is that we have spent a lot of time and effort to build a very encompassing system. So the system really covers everything from the initial inception of just the idea of creating the idea and then beginning to actually produce the content and being able to manage that whole production process, including the media and, of course, including all the people involved. Uh, so on the chart that you just saw, that would be on, the, uh, on your, sorry, your uh, left-hand side, the production part. Um, that really grew out of working for production and post-production houses. The second big module that you see around the core is the device integration and workflow engine. If you are a broadcaster, your interest is in managing the throughput that you have in content in a highly automated fashion to do that as fast as you can with as little human resource involved as, you, uh, as is possible due to speed and due to cost, of course. So that's a separate module which is very popular for larger corporations or larger broadcasters, let's say. Then at the top of the chart, you saw a word called archive. That sounds very simple uh, because it goes it actually is a lot more than just the archive. So I'm referring to the box up here. That's really where your staff works. You will have different types of staff. You will have technical staff who will want to uh, integrate third party machinery, who will want to create automated workflows. But of course, you have editorial staff. And that staff would not care and is not interested in really understanding what your technical processes are. So you need to be able to offer them a GUI, i.e. an environment to work in, which is focused on editorial work. And that is what we call the archive. We call it archive because that's how our customers refer to it. And then the final um, and very important point is, of course, play out, which is just another word for I'm now going to actually monetize my content by showing it or delivering it. Mm -hmm. So what makes us strong is that we have all of these different modules but with the twist that you can, and because we have different customers, they have different needs, at least different initial needs. So we may have customers who say, I just want to run a production ingest process with dailies, let's say. And that's it. It might even be just for a short period of time. You rent the system, use the system, you say goodbye. Or perhaps you like the system and you stick to it. So you then add an additional module and you start using the archive. As the system develops, even in your own usage, you may discover that you have certain delivery workflows that you'd also like to take, you know, have taken care of and to automate to save money. Uh, and you just keep adding modules, basically. So we, this just uh, is a, a kind of a headline chart. Yeah. There are about 40 different uh, modules, which basically are business purpose. And they can be combined in any shape or form that you like. They can be bought, they can be rented, they can be on-premise, they can be hosted. They can run as an edge computing system. So there's lots and lots of variants. And I think the two points of uh, we are a very encompassing system, and yet we give the customer all the freedom to pick and choose what he'd like to start with and then perhaps grow if he likes the system, does set us apart. Thirdly, uh, I have to mention it, I think we're quite affordable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just mentioned that uh, there is the opportunity to start small with a yeah. use case and grow yeah. then. Could you give a few examples of customers which started with one part of their needs and then mm -hmm. grown to another system? Well, oddly enough, pretty much every customer that we have started with one single need because that was where you know, the, the need was most pressing and the pain was biggest. So they came to us and said, look, this is our current problem. For example, we have a huge stock of material and we can't find anything. But as they would progress and we've sorted out their archive for them and finally made it transparent and available, they realized, ooh, we're getting new material in, so we'd like to add an ingest part. And once they've done all of that, they may come to realize, but now we need to play out all of that wonderfully curated content, which is now all sorted and it's got all its metadata, we've approved it, but it now needs to be delivered for example, needs to be delivered to a VOD platform. I'd like to deliver that to Netflix. How do I do that? If I'm just delivering to Netflix, fairly easy. If I'm delivering to 200 different VOD platforms, it gets very messy if I try to do that by hand. And so customers have kind of traveled that route as I just des described. But there are lots of different entry points. I mean, we've had customers who said, I just really need to deliver to 50 VOD platforms, but I don't want to have an archive. And the archive then 
kind of came later mm. because they were happy with the software and they liked it and so they kept migrating more and more jobs into it, mm. which was, I think, excellent for us, of course. Of course. But I think uh, it's good for the customer too because he can actually give us a proper trial run and it's not just a demo, it's, it's the real thing. If you don't like it, you leave and the rent ends. If you like it, you decide to grow. All that complex jobs do need the workflow engine, which is built into the system. Could mm -hmm. you explain a little bit how that works and how maybe a customer could do it himself, or does he need your help all yeah. the time? Um, the basic principle of what we call the device and workflow manager is really twofold. Um, pretty much every environment will have not just one machine, they'll have lots of different machines, be it, for example, a camera, a storage, an editing suite, uh, another uh, database for metadata. Um, <clears throat> they could have a website which plays out content or a broadcast system, a scheduler, etc. So it's an endless list. The first part of, the, of that system, the device manager, allows you to attach any device to the system. We do that by API, so we have a lot of connectors to uh, a lot of well-known third-party systems, list. very yeah. long list, um, yeah. be it from a transcoder to an editing suite to broadcast systems. But of course you can connect via other routes too, uh, depends on what the third-party system is able to do and offers. Um, so given the idea that we can actually collect all of the machinery that is used and sort of have it navigatable in one central area, that takes you to the second part, that's the workflow manager which basically takes the approach, a workflow is a chain of events. So each step in that chain of events, each chain link is a certain functionality. For example, once ingested, please do quality control. So the quality control might even be using a third party system, but we would send the file to the third party system in the right format, in the right qualities, uh, get back the result of that quality control system and then take a yes or left or right decision. Was the quality okay? Then it's green, then we'll continue along our chain link. If it was red, we'd probably send it back to whoever uploaded it. So I could go on endlessly, yeah. of course, you can imagine, but a customer would have these chains of events, and the trick is you can obviously build these chains of events into the system by themselves. Now, you as a customer would know best what your processes look like, our job is to really give you the total freedom and the autonomy to build those workflows yourself. So we can build them for you, but you can probably build them yourself. Our job is to make the system so easy to operate and so under readily understandable by a techie to actually construct your own workflow. Because it's not just, I need to construct a workflow, you then need to go and edit that workflow. Uh, media is a very live environment. Things change the whole time. New qualities come along, new delivery targets come along. So we need to be able to give the customer the ability to fully autonomously create any workflow they'd like, even inject own pieces of script if they have some very specific task they'd like uh, uh, done by the system, and they are able to write a piece of script just for that. Uh, they can use our system to host that script in a certain sense mm -hmm. and make it part of their workflows. So if they, the customer is getting a new tool, like a quality control or new transcoder mm -hmm. or a new delivery goal on the other side, yeah. they need your help or could they do that themselves? No, well, they, well, they theoretically they could do it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> we recommend that you simply drop us a line and tell us what you just bought uh, or maybe even what you're interested in if you would like some advice. Uh, on what machines to get because we have a lot of experience and we usually have connectors ready mm. and you just buy them, to be honest, yeah. uh, or rent them and we put them on your system and you're good to go. Perfect. So you brought us the customer example which shows a little bit how the product works mm -hmm. and how it could be used. Do you like to show it to us? Sure. Um, I just need to quickly jump from screen to screen. Where's my mask on? Um, what I'm going to show you first is uh, very simply the um, GUI that an editorial user would be using. Why am I showing you this and not a very technical part? Because the large majority of your users are actually editorial users. So let's just log in here. I'm going to deliberately, of course, pick the example of Porsche because I like Porsche and maybe you like them too. Um, and of course, they are. Um, 
they're an excellent um, reference for us. Uh, this particular GUI that we're looking at right now, we call this the Flow Archive. And you can see down here, I'm just going to narrate through what you have. Up here you have different types of searches, from full text search to an expert search. You can upload material. There are lots of ways of uploading content into such a system. Uh, be it uh, browser upload, be it through an FTP, but of course you can go more professional, not just do it by network, but do it by all sorts of um, transfer agents, signal disparity and the like. So there's lots of ways into the system, and of course the system is geared to, to detect what content is coming in, to do a quality control. Oh, that will work. Super, the thank you very much. The mouse is back. The mouse is back, mine. Um, so the system will typically uh, check what files are coming in and make sure the files actually meet your specifications. Uh, because if we can exclude rubbish coming in, you're not going to have rubbish in your system. Very simple thought. Uh, the next thing you see down here uh, is, of course, I have a, uh, a search result. Let me just do that. I'm going to go to the expert search because I happen to have stored something there already. So if I search for something, I can pick out, do I just want videos? Do I want pictures? Do I want documents? The system, of course, does everything. And uh, there's lots of ways you can depict the content. Um, in this particular view, I'm just looking through a very general search. So I see some of the key metadata. If I open a piece of content, and this is the proverbial uh, media container that I was referring to earlier, that media container will now show you the preview video. Of course, I can let this run. Uh, I'm not going to really run this too long because it's with sound, obviously. Um, it gives you all the metadata that you have for your content. Now, this metadata is, of course, customer specific. So every customer has a totally different set of metadata, and they probably have a different visualization of that metadata as well. So up here we have the, the most important key metadata. Then you can see down here extended metadata. This is usually uh, production information, rights information is down here. Uh, production information, there we are. Release information, this particular uh, piece hasn't been released. That tells you who approved a publication and uh, for what purpose. Uh, the distribution button will tell you where has this been published to. And as you can see here, I'm going to show you this example, News TV in a second, what uh, distribution specific metadata am I going to add? Because you will have different metadata per distribution channel. Uh, so you might have distribution, uh, sorry, you might have archive metadata, distribution metadata for website A, website B, website C separated, social media, broadcast, VOD, all of that is probably different metadata to some degree. So we will cater for all of that. And of course, I'll show you history. Then a little bit. Just yeah. a quick remark. All that information you see here yeah. could be customized. So it, it's the customer's decision which fields are shown, or does it come with the standard product? No, it comes, it basically every flow center comes with a standard set of metadata which is very easily customizable and it is customized for absolutely every uh, single customer because everybody's a little bit different. Uh, we do advise people on uh, if they are into monetizing, for example, what metadata do you need to monetize on, let's say, the top 50 VOD platforms because we know what we need to deliver. And we will actually put that in the system for you and also make sure that you fill in the fields because yeah. otherwise you won't be able to publish and not make money. So, um, <clears throat> no, that's freely editable. In fact, you as a customer can edit that, edit this part yourself mm. if you like to do that. Otherwise, we will do it for you. It's no big deal and you can change it three times a week if you like. Uh, Which is not very useful. It's but not very clever, but you can do it. Most yeah. people end up doing it a little bit. So yeah. you, you could um, change it in the settings, yes. I assume. Yes, exactly. Okay. And uh, there are other bits. There's certain information that Jutta might be allowed to see, but I may not be allowed to see. So uh, I can hide fields. I can make certain fields available for you to edit, which I may be able to see, but would not be able to mm. edit. And you can break that down very, very finely uh, because remember, you are also often talking with uh, your boss. You don't want to give him any ed editing rights except no. for the approval button. Better not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you may be talking to your suppliers. Mm. Uh, you, you do want them to uh, enter some of the metadata because you don't want to do the typing yourself, um, but you don't want them to see other relevant metadata. 
So there's lots of ways of, of uh, slicing and dicing the metadata, but it is hugely important. And it is really a cost driver. It's very important to be flexible there and to understand what you're doing. And it is simply important to make sure other people do as much as, uh, of the typing as is possible, uh, especially when, when working with external producers, because they'll know and they're ready to type. So let them do that and just control what they're doing. Don't mm -hmm. type it yourself. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, a little bit more about the screw because I could probably go on to, for quite a long time. I just quickly wanted to finish this media container. So you have all the metadata. Then other things that are very popular down here are internal comments that you could write. Uh, down here you see uh, the so-called media file folders. And I don't know if you remember, but I mentioned before, this particular video exists in several languages. It exists in different technical qualities. It exists with subtitles, or it exists with and without branding. All of those variants also belong to the same content. So what we've got down here is what we call the, um, the media file container, and it basically stores all your variants in the same spot. So it becomes very easy to navigate. It becomes very easy because most of these qualities are automatically produced by the flow center. It becomes very easy to make sure, for example, if you're publishing, that the appropriate qualities are there because the machine will do it for you and it's all going to be automatic but they'll show yeah. up in here. So it's, uh, it's, it's fairly foolproof. We try to be as foolproof as we, as we can. And lastly down here of course you may have so-called related media which is not the same content but something let's say by the same author with the same actor etc etc. You could put that in here. What's um, about the versioning? Uh, versioning is part of the system, which is, of course, important. Uh, versioning you could handle either through the media file container. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you would then designate them as edit version 1, edit version 2, etc., etc., up until you, got, you have an approved edit version that would get a separate designator. And only that would be allowed to be published. All of the previous versions would be in the system and available for review, but would explicitly be barred from publication, so nothing goes wrong. Um, over here, on the, just to complete the GUI a little bit, you have what we call projects. Projects is very simple. It's an internal collaboration tool. So projects are basically folders that allow you to make individual collections. You could create a new folder. I'm not going to do this because it's a live system. And simply pull content into that, um, into that folder via drag and drop. You can see that here. I'm just uh, pretending a little bit. So the project, again, can be handled with, uh, by inviting specific people to your project, um, making uh, projects available throughout the, your own organization, or just making it a private project that only I can see, because it's my piece of work, and up until I'm done and I'm ready to show my boss for approval, um, I don't want anybody else in the project. Rooms is something similar, but it's a very important point. It's a collaboration tool. So whilst you're, of course, collaborating internally, you know, your partner, the guy down the, down the hall, etc., your boss, whoever you might be working with internally, you have a lot of external partners too. Think of the photographer. Think of the external producer. Think of the people doing your uh, subtitles. Think of the people doing the, uh, the, uh, um, the dubbing, etc., etc. There could be lots and lots of external production partners. Now, how do I work with the system, with one single system, and just one file. Well, we use the rooms, and basically what the rooms allow you to do is to create a microsite that the system makes for you, to furnish that uh, site with specific content, and let's say you were my external uh, translator. translator. <laughs> I would be able to uh, make a file available to you in a very low quality, because you are only interested in creating the audio or even the subtitle text for you to download for a specific period of time, even including the branding, which is automatically rendered in, so you don't run off and put it on, on uh, Facebook or something. Uh, and then the system would allow you, through the very same room, to upload your work results. So you've downloaded the file, you've done your work uh, at your office, and then via the same room, you would be able to upload your audio tracks. I would get a notification, I can review and approve, and if I'm happy, the system would render your audio tracks onto the new French version, let's say. Mm -hmm. What is about critical content? 
Well, uh, like we have, uh, I don't be allowed to download or to oh, yeah. share or something. How well, we, do you it's it's fairly simple, as you can maybe even see here in the GUI. Um, there is a there are statuses. You can see that up here. I'm not quite sure if uh, you guys on the other side of the screens can see that. Uh, this particular item has a status released, so mm. I'm allowed to publish it on a website, let's say, or put it on a, a TV system. If I had critical content, of course we have that, especially with car manufacturers, because they have all their prototypes on the system. There are lots and lots of different ways of, of uh, safeguarding critical content. The most secure one is have a separate group or a separate flow center. So even though both flow centers work as one, Separate content is kept on a separate machine with very limited access and the users who have the rights to that content, and there might be just a handful, would be able to see the content through both systems, but for example would only be able to upload onto the secret system. Uh, a much more simple way is to use these statuses. For example, if I just take the Porsche example, if I look at the type of statuses they have in preparation, so it's new, in processing, somebody is working on it, released, but they see released but not public. Mm. That in Porsche's world means a select few of the users will actually be able to see that content. Uh, others uh, would not find that in any way, they would search for it, there's no way they, they would ever be able to access it. I can also create deep archives or um, you know, basically say something is blocked and it's, it's your open definition of what that really means. But so there's lots of ways. Of, yeah, for yeah. me as a translator, yeah. I need to see the content before it's released. Right. So. Well, what I would do is I would say, uh, I'm going to make that content available to you, but I would automatically brand the content, mm -hmm. which means I'm going to brand every single frame. And with the watermark. Say, with the watermark, it would say, um, private copy for Jutta and the date possibly. Okay. So if that ended up anywhere, it would be kind of obvious. Uh, it would be kind of obvious who published it there. <laughs> okay, good. And you would be taking the court, not me. Uh, mind, mind you, I mean, we work uh, with Hollywood Studios as well. So mm -hmm. that's a process that they are aware of and they use in, in different uh, environments as well, not just from us, of course, but that's tried and tested. Okay, good. What's special about the Porsche system compared to others? Well, one of the uh, key focuses uh, I placed already before was all about uh, publication and making money. Now, so what were Porsche's real needs when they came to us? They basically said, we have a wealth of content. In fact, we don't even know how much content we have, but we know it's a lot. Uh, so point number one is find all the content. Where is it? Make sure it all goes into one system. The point number two they had was, we also have a lot of metadata, but it's all over the place. It's on different systems, in different qualities, with different logic, so it's a, it's a bit of a mess to be honest, but they're not the only ones. Um, we uh, catered to that and we fixed it, so now they have one system, all the content is in that system, all the metadata is structured, uh, not just in terms of you know what metadata is there, but also who has access to what metadata and to what content. Um, the third big part that uh, Porsche has started, and we're still in the midst of uh, rolling that out to all sorts of different target groups is publication. So they wanted to make the content available. Who are the, uh, the people they want to make things available to? Well, of course, there's the general public. Mm. So Just to interrupt yes. you quickly, could you give us an idea how the project itself went? What, what was the time from the start until the platform was live? Right. How long does it take to, to collect all that information and bring it to one system? Yeah. Well, off the top of my head, in Porsche, let's take that example, we could probably identify five phases. Phase number one is understanding what do they have and where does it sit. So that's pre-system, so to speak, it's just to understand where is it at. To be able to look at the various bits and to understand what is available to us, technically as uh, editorially. Uh, point number two was really designing the system for them and then building that. That's a, a fairly longer phase because it also has a lot of interaction with the customer. We might propose a set of metadata, we might propose a certain visualization of the GUI, and they would come back and say, oh, we like that, but we'd like to change this, or we have an additional idea or an additional need. So that phase two, the actual developing of the system, is something that we do in a very interactive way with the customers. 
um, because it, for them it's usually the first time they're building something like this. For us, it's the nth time. Yeah. So we're very good at giving advice, and you know we try and guide them into a certain direction, which we know will work. Um, once we've finished that phase, we actually start ingesting everything. Uh, that's technically quite tricky at times because we then you know we need to talk to a lot of their partners, and they might be reluctant to even give us the content. So we need to make that ingest very easy for everybody and as automated as possible. For sure, there will never be any typing, so everything needs to come into the system in an automated uh, way. Um, <clears throat> and having done that, we really go very quickly into phase four, um, which at Porsche we're talking about, we're now from the original inception, we're about six, maybe seven months down the road. We were done with all the ingest, all the metadata was there, the GUI was finished. And the next phase was really trying to um, uh, involve the internal users, the larger group of internal users, which at Porsche is a, a thousand plus users, which means training, which means getting feedback, which means additional ideas, additional needs, additional wants, and seeing what will then go into the system. <clears throat> that kind of depends who your customer is. If it's an industrial with lots of people, you'll have lots of, lots of feedback, of course. If you're talking to a smaller broadcast or production house, there'll be fewer people, a lot fewer people. So that phase will be very short, usually. Um, and then we really go into phase five, and that, in Porsche's term, was publication. So they came around to that pretty quickly. After about eight months, they said, you know what, we just realized we don't have any video on any of our, home so of, uh, any of our websites. Quite shocking, mm. uh, but true. They actually didn't have any video anywhere on any Porsche websites. So they came to us and said, uh, well, can you fix that, please, and can you do that really, really quick? Because we have the launch of the new 911 model uh, just three weeks away. So phase five in the case of Porsche was doing the publication. Just, uh, just one yes. question, very practically. With all that restrictions of travel and be in person with the customer, is that a problem? How, how well, do you practically work on projects? Well, it, uh, put it this way, I mean, we, everybody's gotten used to remote working by now. Uh, we've been doing it for a long time. We work for big customers, obviously not just in Munich, <clears throat> so around Europe uh, and much beyond. Um, we very often work um, in a very deep relationship with our customers, so we know their environment very well because we've been involved in it for a while. Um, we frequently, and we very much like that, have a local partner who knows the customer, speaks the language, is in the same time zone, it makes a real difference, it, mm. it's a real help. So, hello to India, you know who I'm talking about, obviously. <laughs> um, that works very well. We do um, try to have joint kickoff meetings for bigger projects, uh, where we travel to the customer to really understand the environment, to really be told from the horse's mouth, so this is what we do, this is how we do it, this is how we've done it so far, in our mind, this is what we'd really like to have, to really try and get a good understanding as we can. And that also gives us the, the chance to demo as many systems as we can, because it's just seeing is believing, and it just gives the customer so many ideas. Oh, yeah, I'll do it that way. That usually helps. We can do that all remote, um, but it's easier if you do it in a, in a joint session. Of course. But um, i just like to highlight that it's no problem to start projects even if it's not possible to travel. Yeah. So uh, we can do all that set up together with Raoul Com to um, help you to kick off a project and um, implement the first steps. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, we, we, you know, obviously, we, we're in the digital world ourselves, so we work a lot digitally. Exactly, and it's all about uh, video. So. Yeah, yep, that's it. Yeah. Die Room Delivery Vorteile noch zeigen, die auch gerade in der Pandemie Could you helfen. give us the help um, about the publishing side now? Yeah. Um, very briefly, because I used the example of Porsche. So as I just mentioned, we had at Porsche um, the need to get a website up and running, and here, here's the result. It's called uh, newstv at porsche.com. Uh, if you feel like it, browse it yourself in your good time. And you see on the site, it's a classic uh, video website. It has content, it has categories, the content has metadata of all sorts, as you can see up here. It has various functions from an embed code 
to the permission to download in different qualities, uh, which is, of course, because this is also marketing and sales material, is wanted by Porsche, uh, social media and other sharing, etc., etc. But in the site you itself, you also see it has certain fixed categories up here. And then a little bit further down, it has what we call highlight categories. So they have certain stories they would like to tell, let's say 9-11, the icon, uh, which are depicted as what we call separate lanes. So if I, if I click on one of these items, I will get the story of the 9-11 with a specific set of videos, as you can see here. And the system will simply pr play them through now, etc., etc. But the point is, that's a very nice site, and it looks all beautiful, etc. Where does this content and where does the structure come from? Well, the answer is, it doesn't come from a, a CMS because we don't need a CMS, because we are already part of the, the, old, the overall system. You see at Porsche down here, there's a button called distribution. Underneath that, I have the rights to News TV. Now, if I open this, um, this little um, triangle, you can see there are certain categories, for example, the header navigation. And if I open that as well, you can see down here there are certain fixed categories. In these categories, let's go to, well, let's pick up motorsports actually. In the back end, I'm opening up the, the subcategory of the distribution channel called motorsport. This might take a while to load because I probably have endless amounts of videos and our video bandwidth is a bit short. So here you see lots and lots of videos which have been in the back end published to that specific field. You, you said uh, content, you don't need a CMS as yeah. it's in the system, yeah. but where does the content live you show on the website? Well, we can do two things. One, the content shown on the website comes directly from the very same flow center and is the same content. If you don't have too many views and are not geographically too far spread, that's fine. Mm -hmm. We do that a lot. Uh, we do that for big industrials who have a lot of calls. But they're small, short videos. We can save a lot of uh, time and money. At Porsche, where we really have a very large volume of viewers, um, we play the content via a CDN, which we simply integrate as Flowworks. So Porsche doesn't have to worry about that. Uh, when they decide to publish a new content, and you can see that particular content is right here with all of its metadata. Um, uh, and it was simply put there via drag and drop. Um, once you hit the update button, which is hidden here, and I have the right to it, it says update CDN, and we will do the automatic trans uh, coding. We will make sure all the metadata is there. We will provide all the formats needed, push them onto the CDN, and notify the front end that that new content is now available with the following CDN links. The same is true, by the way, for live streaming, which we also do on, on Porsche. Uh, so if you want to create a live event, you simply schedule it in the, in the GUI that we're seeing right here, in the classic Flow Center archive, this one, um, <coughs> to create a live event. Just yeah. about the um, CMS, is it, no, about the CDN, CDN yeah. can the customer choose whatever yeah. he likes? Yeah, we're totally agnostic. So at Porsche, it's, uh, it's Akamai, and admittedly a lot of our customers use Akamai, but I think that's more because it's Everybody knows it and it's kind of mm. easy. Not so much being great that was mass delivery. How want. about individual delivery? What's about the CMS if the customer has, has a CMS? He has an own CMS already yeah. in place yeah. with all the processes. Uh, the, the system would work exactly the same way. So I would basically be able to create the structure of the, of the site in here. Now, the structure I could create in Flow Center or I could get it from the C, uh, CMS. Uh, that's just an API call, very simple. And if there's a piece of content that you would like to have published, all you do, you take it and you drag it to wherever you want it to go. I'm not doing this again right now because it's a live system. And by dropping it, you are basically triggering the workflow. The flow center would create the derivatives, i.e. the transcoded version would make sure all your metadata is there or notify you that you need to fill in something. Um, the flow center would put it on the CDN. And lastly, the Flow Center would then notify your existing CMS. This article is now available for, pub for publication, and here are the media paths. Are you aware? Is it on the, is it on the CDN? If I use the Flow Center as a CMS, mm -hmm. where do I type all the text, the description, and how does it work practically for the person which needs to type the text? To how how does the text and the video came together? Uh, 
the video, this is the live example. Let's just go back to the, to the play outside. Um, we were in motorsport, let me just open up the same clip again. This is the clip, and here you see the metadata that's shown on the website, okay? Where does all of that come from? It comes directly out of here. So this is the very same clip, and you can see down here there's a button called distribution, and as a designator, I have the rights to web t uh, to news TV, and you can see the metadata. Welche IT-Tendermitte ist bereits integriert und welche kommt in der Zukunft? He's added the metadata, here you are, simply typed it in or copied it in, and then he went, uh, I'm saving that, right, saving, and then he said, I'm going to now publish this content, I'm going to publish it here. Mm. And he let go of it, and that was it. So it's extremely fast, and of course you can really see, you can automate a lot of that as well. We got a question from a viewer, um, which is directly related to that, uh, AI. AI. Which uh, AI technology is used already, maybe, or uh, what do you plan in that uh, area in future? Well, we're in a very comfortable position because we simply hook up other people's AI systems. So we basically do uh, transcription, so speech to text, pretty much in any language that is available as an AI tool. Um, we do translation, so once we have a written text, which could be just metadata or could be a uh, transcription, we will translate that into pretty much every language under the sun. Again, that could be a single AI system. It could even be a multitude of AI systems. What we have built in is the ability for an editor to check. So, um, you know, we before publishing, we usually show the complete metadata, the whole transcript and the translation. If the editor would like to intervene, he can. He can also do that post-publishing, of course, and correct something. Uh, we do original character recognition, so let's say in a video you have a, a panning shot and there's a, a street sign, so we would actually read out what it said on that street sign, or you have, let's say, in a news article, you would have, um, uh, you know, something graphic uh, component at the bottom of the screen telling you this is the date and this is the location, so we would read all of that stuff out. Uh, we can integrate um, uh, face recognition, popular for politicians. Mm. Uh, we can integrate scene detection uh, of all types. Uh, there is yeah, what I quite like and I, I, I'm quite a fan of automated trailer production. So I have a 19 minute uh, feature film, but I need a, let's say, 15 second trailer. There's actually a very nice AI tool out there which we've integrated, which will make me a trailer automatically. And it actually looks good. I think it's mm. worth uh, publishing it okay. directly, even without review and so on and so forth. So there's lots of different tools out there. We're in the comfortable yeah, position that we simply hook them up. And they are easy to hook up because they're all made to be hooked up. Mm -hmm. um, what we have done just to highlight our competencies is for a live streaming event, for example, and now imagine you saw the Porsche example. We have a live event at Porsche and they are presenting a new car. Their live events will typically be in German and English. They would not be in Russian. They would not be in French, they would not be in Hindi, they would not be in Spanish. That's a bit of a shame because there's probably a lot of viewers out there who'd like to see the presentation in their own language. What we've built is, for example, take, we take the live stream, we clip off the audio uh, track, we chunk that, we send it to AI systems to give us translations, we get the translation back, we do subtitles from the translation, and we chunk the subtitles back into the live stream and we, uh, we need about a five second uh, buffer to do all of that and it runs fully automatic. So it's not just about generating additional metadata, but it's about generating entirely new uh, customer services. So what we're gonna do at Porsche next, once we finally got them uh, to, to uh, go for this, we're going to basically auto-translate all of their live events into 20 different languages live. And that's Is this something to, free? No. <laughs> Sorry, but it's, it's not whopping expensive. I mean, you know what yeah. the charges might be from the AI services. They cost differently. Yeah. 
Um, but what we are very good at is optimizing how much do we send them because we only need a transcript. Let's say we will only send them audio chunks. We would mm -hmm. never send a whole video. We don't need to. So we're fast, bandwidth lean, and we use as much of the AI as the customer wants to invest, not more. We got the question if you do all of this also for broadcast customers. Oh yeah, sure. That's where we're, we really come from. So our very first customer, I'm not quite sure if the audience has heard of them before, is called Pro7. Uh, that's a, a very large private broadcaster here in Germany, or actually across Europe. Uh, they currently operate, as far as I know, it's about 17 channels, uh, mostly German speaking, but not just. So we've been working for them for um, 15 years. So we have a lot of experience there. And that's one of those customers where we really have an extremely deep integration, uh, where we've really integrated all of their environment. Uh, we do all sorts of services from them, from ingest of editorial content, ingest of all of the advertising material that any of the channels use, Europe-wide goes through us. We do all their program communication, for example. Uh, to give you another example, you may know the, uh, the brand name RTL a little better. Um, uh, we work for them here as well. We do all of their monetization business outside of classic TV. So they actually uh, produce and buy content to republish on VOD sites, their own sites, plus third party sites. They've made, it, made that into business. So we actually operate all of that for them. Uh, so helping them not just save money, but actually make money. Make money yeah. uh, we work for French Television. That's the state broadcaster with about, uh, I think currently it's about 19 channels. Uh, so we also work in French. <laughs> <laughs> um, the focus for them is really um, a journalistic communication. So what's scheduled, what programs do they have up and coming, and how do they communicate to that, that to journalistic target group? because obviously they want the journalists to report on the upcoming program to advertise it, really. We work with Swiss TV. Uh, we work a lot for uh, MTV or Viacom, again, in the field of, of content distribution and monetization. So there's a lot of examples. Yeah, so as far as I remember, the Swiss TV is the with the conferencing It's also thing. Swiss TV. Yeah, Swiss Maybe TV you can well. explain it, because I think that's a good example how we can use the system now in the times that we are not coming yeah. together. Yeah, um, one of the one of the ways Swiss TV uses the um, the tool is to, um, if you recall from earlier, I talked about the collaboration uh, modules, the rooms, and the rooms are all about me being able to create a microsite automatically and to select content that I would like Jutta to view and just Jutta. So I would tell the system what to do. The system would create a microsite, and actually actually show you very briefly what that would look like for Porsche, um, provided the internet plays along. All right. It's a bit of a slow start. Here we go. No. I'm sure it's coming. Here we are. Yay! We have content. <laughs> so as you can see, it obviously it's got a nice Porsche branding. You can see up here in the URL, it's a specific URL. This microsite uh, has specific content. You can see that down here. Uh, which is showable and viewable, of course, uh, by the recipients. And it shows you uh, an excerpt of the media, uh, sorry, of the metadata that is available for that content. So down here is the different type of content uh, and per, uh, per minutes, yeah. different uh, metadata. Then this particular site is furnished with a, with a specific function, and that's the download. Very simple. So in this particular use case, Jutta might be a journalistic user, might be a collaborative uh, production user who needs to do the subtitles, etc., etc. So I would not just send her the site, but I would also allow her to download this content with the branding that we talked about. Um, <clears throat> using this, this chassis of the room, uh, we have a system by, let me just see if I actually have that here. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think. Ooh, One no, 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 really, really important um, point we need to highlight is that how the front end looks and how the, the page looks you show to your outside customer, to your um, service provider, uh, in the video on demand portal of your own uh, broadcasting environment. It's on the customer how it looks like, what we For can sure. see here. Um, it's complete different uh, frame around, but the content itself, which is shown, is video, 
and related content. And related slides. And oh, no, no, the sites, there's, there's lots and lots of different uh, views, pretty much any view that a customer can come up with. It could be a home page, it could be a classic video site, uh, like a media archive, it could be a press page, for example, all of the SAP, uh, so SAP, the yeah. software company, all of their yeah. global press and uh, web Marketing, TV stuff yeah. is all from us. Um, it could be a sales site, uh, if you are selling content. It could be a, uh, you know, selling to other buyers, such as other broadcasters. It could be a VOD platform, directed at end customers, of course. It could be this type of service, uh, collaboration sites of all designs and, and usages that you can come up with. Uh, it could be uh, production management sites, such as for SAP, we run the global ingest of material. So they have quite a few external agencies worldwide, but everything goes through the flow center of SAP to make sure the metadata is, the com uh, is all there, the qualities are acceptable, uh, the processes are followed, i.e. who gets to review and approve what before it hits the SAP archive, uh, never mind the SAP playout sites. Mm. So I think what we not mentioned at all yeah. so far is that beside all the platforms we can show here um, and we see the result, you could deliver to classical broadcasting. Oh, sure. uh, we, yeah. we can't show it here <laughs> because we don't have the, uh, the live uh, demo coordination with the customer, but of course we can um, hand over the content to classical playout oh, sure, systems sure. and give it to uh, on air. Yeah, and we do that in, you know, we integrate deeply with scheduling systems, so we do it in a very timely fashion. Uh, broadcast servers typically uh, aren't archives, they're not made to carry a lot of information at the same time. Uh, so we manage that process, we pick up the information from a scheduling system, when is what show going to be on air, and then we go through our own processes to make sure the content is there, the metadata is there, the approvals are there, maybe related content is there, um, which includes stuff like press notifications, of course, you know, people tend yeah. to forget about that, um, that versions for online are there, versions for social media are there, um, and we basically guide the editorial users through the checklist. So what have I got to make sure that is, is got to be there prior to airing next Wednesday? And of course, uh, you know, come, come let's say it's, uh, it's a Wednesday noon show. Uh, by come Tuesday noon, we will make sure the file is moved over to the broadcast environment. No glitches. If there is a glitch, if there is some sort of problem, could be connectivity, storage, whatever, we will find out and we will tell the editor and the technical guy well in advance. And well to fix. Yeah. One customer asked if he can have a manual to go through that to learn more about the system. Um, we just got a question. Um, if there is a manual, um, they can see uh, where they can see all the different functions. Uh, the system offers or like a catalog or a product description, something? Well, what we actually, since we're all about media, uh, more video media, we actually, we've kind of given up on writing manuals because <laughs> everything is a little bit different customer to customer. So we produce a lot of um, how-to videos. It's basically uh, screen videos which will guide you through individual parts of the system or individual processes, how to ingest, how to upload, how to edit metadata how to run project management, how to collaborate. And yes, we can make that available. Um, we're just actually rebuilding the, the things because we keep obviously developing the surfaces and the GUIs, so the visualization changes too. Um, but sure, we can make that available, at least for the, sort of the headline stuff. But please feel free to also contact uh, us because we're here to show you and we'd be more than happy to show you online as well and then also make screen videos of that. Yeah. A, to review a part of that videos the are the also the um, available on our website and on our YouTube channels. We did a lot of webinars already in the past and they are all available there to, to get a better impression of the different functions of the yeah. systems. We are coming to an end. Is there something you like to highlight at the end? or? Well, um, it's, it's difficult to put it in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a tight environment, but let me show you one thing that maybe I would like to highlight uh, uh, to everybody. Um, I mentioned before, going, going back to this chart, uh, it's a very large system and it does a lot of different things, 
and it comes as modules. So you can activate uh, modules or not activate them depending on where you are at uh, in, your, in your building on a system. Uh, one of the key things that obviously we always get asked is, well, can I have it on-premise? Yes, you can. Can I have it hosted? Yes, I can. Uh, can I have it in the cloud? Yes, you can. Um, and how much does all of this cost? So there's, a, there's one thing I'd like to show you, and this is called the Flow Ant. Now, the, uh, the very sharp-eyed viewer will have already seen the little box on this chart is a Intel Nook. So basically, what you see here is a man in a box. It's basically a piece of hardware, mostly Intel hardware, comes in different sizes with the MAM on it. This is an affordable, easy entry because it comes pre-configured in a lot of things, or it allows you a lot of freedoms, but it, become, it comes pre-configured and it's very much plug and play. Uh, and this particular box obviously is a, is a price attractive offering um, where we're basically saying, well, why would somebody need to spend 10,000 US dollars on a big server if it's five guys in, and an editing suite. So why don't we get rid of all the server stuff because we can do that on the small box. Um, so I'd love to tell you a little bit more about that if we have time. Uh, see that as an entry level system. It's actually quite a powerful system because it does everything that we do for big broadcasters, but it does it in a small box with a smaller price tag attached admittedly. And then we have a, an evolution of this box, and that's not called the Flow Ant, it's called the Flow Edge. The clue about the Flow Edge is it's actually the first edge computing system in the market, as far as we can tell. The idea is to speed up processes and to economize wherever we can in making use of cloud services. So for those of you who will have tried, it's not much fun trying to upload really big files into the cloud only to have them transcoded there and made available there because it will eat up a lot of bandwidth, take a lot of time, and the storage there will cost you a lot of money. So we've developed a version of the Flow and called the Flow Edge, and that basically is your local system which partners with a cloud system. Um, very interesting. You know, we, we were just about to really launch that, so it was a bit of a preview. Okay. Since you asked yeah, for so the, the small box is also an opportunity you could use for uh, the different smaller sites. Like yeah. you have the main broadcaster and then the remote studios all yeah. over the world, and there are not so many people and they do not have so much content, so they can use just a small uh, system and let's talk it to the home, to the big system. Yeah. Exactly. We got a question, and then I'd like to come slowly to the end. If there are any customer in sports? Um, well, yes, the broadcasters obviously have sports content yeah. in that sense, so we we're very familiar with how that gets produced, how that com comes into the system, the time, the time lags, or the, the non-existing yeah. time lags, i.e. the time criticalness of content mm. uh, of that nature. Um, so we don't have a specific producer who just does sports. We have a lot of producers who also do sports, and we have a lot of broadcasters who also do sports. Uh, so obviously we're quite familiar with what happens in sports, let's say soccer. Uh, we work uh, for, that might be interesting to you, we work for uh, the Soccer Federation and for the Ice Hockey Federation, which is kind of the other end of the spectrum. So the stuff has been produced. It's happened, it's also been broadcast. We basically make copies of the broadcast and then make it available for the, um, for the, uh, the leagues, uh, the empires, etc., etc., and third party publication. So, uh, though we may not have this dedicated customer, <laughs> it's a big field but and we cover pretty much all of it. Yeah. So, then I would like to thank you. My pleasure. Um, as far as I know, there are no more questions from the customer side. So you could ask us at any time um, by email or um, contact Raoul.com and they help you. We are happy to answer. We are happy, as Oliver mentioned, we can produce smaller clips about special use cases to show you how the system could work in your environment. Yeah. Just uh, yeah. Tell us what you need and tell uh, Raoul what your email address is. We'll send you a room. That's what it's for. Perfect. The recording of that webinar will be available online um, in a few days from today. And we like to thank you, Oliver, and to all our viewers. Have a great day and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Ciao, ciao.